Yeah, thank you, uh, Olga, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure now to do the second installment of the webinar series uh, and uh, the webinar on more a theoretical insight, right? That's what we are doing today, <clears throat> a theoretical insight. And I guess that everybody here today are also interested to learn more about the concepts we are using in Virtual Lab. It will be quite some white today, I must say, so it will take some time. Uh, the one hour will be probably not enough. No, definitely not enough. So uh, that means uh, that we'll be some right through the theoretical concepts uh, in praxis and theory of virtual lab. So let's uh, fasten seatbelts and enjoy this uh, right in the, uh, I think, really fascinating uh, world of physical optics and its implementation in virtual fusion. Now, the overview for uh, this presentation uh, is as follows, very, very short and uh, compact. The first question I'd like to discuss with you is why physical optics at all? So why do we do that? And then how to make physical optics modeling fast? These are the two only questions I'd like to deal with uh, in this uh, seminar because webinar, because that is exactly what our starting point is when we deal with software development. We have decided very early that we do physical optics. I come to this. And then, of course, when we like to do physical optics, it's absolutely essential to make it useful. And that means mainly fast. And now comes, in my opinion, the clue. When we answer this question in the consequent way, you will see that the answers to these questions lead us automatically to an understanding on how geometrical optics is embedded in physical optics in a very practical, accessible, and controllable way. That is really, in my opinion, the most fascinating thing that we do work consequently along these questions, we come to this. And of course, uh, we will show also in particular Christian with his demonstrations, we'll show how this fact uh, is brought to fusion in the new version, virtual fusion 2023.1, 20, and of course, the coming ones. So it means how do we bring that to fusion that general optics is embedded in physical optics in a very practical, accessible, and controllable way. That, of course, is related to what we discussed already on Monday, if you were there. Then um, in the Monday webinars that we have different profiles and these profiles and the editing of these profiles help us to navigate in this space where general optics is accessible. Okay, so let's do this step by step and let's take some time to understand these things. I like to emphasize, as a user of virtual fusion, you don't need to know that all. Because in virtual fusion, we have automatic algorithms which help you to do this without understanding and knowing all of this. But of course, it's helpful always to understand the concepts, the basic concepts to apply a software in a, a very good way. And that just me doesn't mean to go into the details of the physics and the mathematics, but to understand the concepts. That's completely enough. So that is also what we discussed today, mainly just the concepts. Of course, I don't do a mathematical detailed discussion. Now, why physical optics? That's the first question. The answer, I can say the following. Let's assume you are founding a company to do a new software in optics. And then you ask the question, what should we base this software on? Would you really say, let's use the middle optics? What is a well-established technique, but which is just a subset of what we can do? Or would you really say, let's use the most advanced technology we can use and see how far we come with that? So it means we say, Optics and photonics is gaining enormous importance as enabling technology in an ever-growing variety of applications. So many different varieties, so many different applications uh, we have in our user base of virtual fusion um, that it is definitely a lot of different topics. And if you like to handle these things with an optics software, then we are completely uh, convinced that to have a sustainable optics software development, which is able and fit to do all of these things. It must be based not on the oldest technology we have, but on the most advanced classical optics theory. Classical means here quantum optics uh, is a special topic which can be added, but which we don't discuss today, of course. But classical optics means 
physical optics. That means when we see the most advanced situation, it's obviously that physical optics is the most advanced one. So we are our opinion, uh, sustainable optics software development must be based on physical optics. And that is the reason why we do that, right? That is the reason why physical optics is a physical optics software. Now, we understand that, and that's super, super important, not as a decision between physical and general optics, but more like something that physical optics at the core of the software is not a decision against general optics, because physical optics includes general optics. And that means we see the future and what we do already more as a merging and the combination of both, that means a unification. It's also reflected in the word fusion, in the virtual fusion, that we do a fusion, a combination, a unification of these approaches. And let's have a very, very short look in this fact. The physical optics is, includes general optics. That's a well accepted fact. You can find it, for example, here in the book from Zale Teich. So that is a very well known accepted fact. So it means our starting point is physical optics includes general optics. And if you accept this truth, then you have a very clear conclusion. That means that the physical optics software in principle must be able to deliver all modeling results you know from general optics. Because if it's a subset, it must be in right? So it means it must be included what you know from general optics. And of course, it must allow you to go beyond where you need. That's absolutely logical. And that's the reason why we do this. And virtual fusion exactly embodies general optics modeling within the framework of physical optics. And you will see in this webinar, how do we do that and how elegant this is accessible to you in a very seamless way, which we have definitely further improved uh, in this new version. Okay, I'd like to mention a little bit about, I talked about the company doing software development. Let's, let's have a look in this once more. The conventional approach in software development and optics software development is that general optics at, is at the core of the software. And that physical optics is needed, but it's more bridgeheads to go into some special fields of physical optics somehow starting from the core of general optics. For example, in lens design software, uh, the point spread function calculation is such kind of piece of physical optics, which is connected here in this case in the axial pupil to general optics. Typically, this interaction is done by some kind of data interface uh, or in the PSF case also embedded in the uh, concept. So that's one concept which is widely used. Obviously, you know that very well. The other approach, also a conventional approach, is quite the opposite. It is using physical optics at the core, but just in a way that you use one universal physical optic solver. Like finite different time domain technique or finite element method. Super powerful stuff, very useful uh, in general, but it is just one software and general optics, how that is embedded, it's not accessible here. It's just what you have with all the limitations from the computational power. We come to this. Now, in contrast, virtual lab fusion using a very unified approach. Physical optics is at the core of our software. That's for sure. The core of our software is physical optics, but not with just one solver, but with a platform of many physical optics solvers. I will discuss that in detail. And you will also see that this approach gives us an unrestricted and seamless transition between the physical optics and general optics in this concept. So it means we see here the difference in our approach. General optics is here, but at the core is physical optics in contrast to other approaches where general optics at the core with a quite limited access to physical optics. So that, that gives a quite clear understanding So what's going on. So it means the first answer to the question, why physical optics? Okay, we are convinced that future proof software development must be based on the most sophisticated optics theory that is physical optics and the important news is physical optics includes, of course, general optics. Let's have a little bit more a look into what physical optics means. In physical optics, the modeling propagates electromagnetic fields. That means the E field and the H field per wavelength, if you do the frequency domain, through an optical system. 
the electromagnetic fields provide the most comprehensive representation of light in optical modeling and design you can have. And we will also discuss that um, on in the Thursday, so that means tomorrow, um, um, in the detector discussion, because there we exactly use that extensively, right? So the detector uh, webinar goes in detail on this. The physical optic software by that, because there is this comprehensive light representation, also uh, gives, of course, then the user the benefit, it's an asset, uh, the benefit of a comprehension uh, by a maximum flexibility in the inclusion of optical effects. That means, of course, wavefront aberrations are included. Energy can be transported. The special distribution of light can be followed. The matter and angular dispersion effects are included. Interference is included. Speckles are included. Diffraction is, of course, included. Scattering is included. Polarization effects, vector field effects, partial coherence effect, spatial temporal light evolution for pulse propagation, etc. So all effects you know from classical optics, that means beyond um, below quantum optics, are all included. And then. Of course, if you have the fields, we have the most flexible way to model source, mo source fields. That always depends on how good uh, the source models are. That is still some research area, I must say, uh, for anybody in the community. Then we have component modeling, very general. So we can, with physical optics, allow the application of any suitable technique to model light interaction with components as accurate as needed. We have no limitations there besides that we like to limit the numerical effort and detector modeling, what we will discuss tomorrow in more detail. So it means that we are working with electromagnetic fields, means it includes all optical effects and source modeling, component modeling, detector modeling. If you have all effects, that does not mean they are all, um, we all need to consider them, but it means that they are included. Sometimes people think that uh, physical optics is just diffraction, but you will see we can even not consider diffraction, but benefit from all the other things, right? So that is very, very important to understand. Now, it means the other reason why we do physical optics, or that is just the next thinking step in a little bit more detailed consideration is physical optics provides by electromagnetic fields, maximum flexibility for modeling of optical effects, sources, components, detectors. So that's, that's exactly what physical optics is giving us. But all these advantages are obvious when the physical optics is at the core of the software, but that doesn't help us if we do a software in this, if this is not also fast. That means this decision to do physical optics must be combined to benefit from all these promising advantages, must be combined with the techniques of fast physical optics algorithms. And now the whole webinar will talk about this. So that means in the whole webinar now, we talk about how to make physical optics modeling fast. Because that is what we do in Virtual Lab. We have a fast physical optics software. And to discuss that, it's a very good idea to first define what fast means. It means what are the key technologies for a fast physical optic software should start, and I'd like to answer this question, should ask, start with the question what fast means. Okay, you know all what fast means, because you all know the most famous fast algorithm, which is the fast Fourier transform algorithm. And from there, you know that genius mathematicians found that the Fourier integral, which is a, which is a, not fast because it's a, at the operation computation complexity of the power of two to the sampling numbers n, that they found a way to do it linear to the sampling number n. It means this is fast. That means the computational complexity of fast algorithm is linear in the number n, which is also notated by this, whereas the number n is the sampling number of sampling points of the function on which the algorithm is applied. So that is what fast means. That means in physical optics, it means we like, we like, I don't say it's always possible, by God not, but we like to use sampling points, electromagnetic field must be sampled, the components must be sampled, and we like to use algorithms wherever possible 
which are linear in the number of sampling points. That is our goal when we are fighting for fast physical optics. So that means fast physical optics applies first, algorithms which are linear in n wherever possible, and that is even not enough because the n can be quite large. We also try to find algorithms where the number n is not too large. And you will see this is done by a hybrid, a hybrid sampling technique which we use throughout the algorithms in virtual lab. Let's talk about the field here, the one time that I do a little bit mathematically, uh, one time here, a little bit in detail. So what does it mean a field component? So we have six field components. Uh, here uh, L is a one to six, so V is a placeholder for all the six field components, right? So that means we have a complex amplitude, rho is x, y. So we have in one plane, we have a field dependent on x, y per wavelength, and we have an amplitude and we have a phase. So um, let's, for example, see this here. It's a Gaussian Laguerre beam, order O1, propagated. You don't see now, but it's a little bit propagated, and that's the amplitude. That's just V lambda rho. Gamma, I don't show now. I'll show later. So that is this amplitude. Now, I have six different field components, typically, and in a general electromagnetic field. If it's per cell, then the Z components are small, but they are also there. Anyway, now comes a point which is super, super essential. In general, in optics, I can extract, if the field is propagated, I can extract a common wavefront phase, which we call psi. And psi is not the whole phase. Psi is just a common phase. You see, there's no L here. It means the psi is the same for all field components. And the UL is residual. That means that it's uh, the beginning, the field in the beginning, uh, and the phase is the difference between, here are some, wrong things here, uh, it's gamma minus psi, okay? So uh, that means um, uh, there is this residual. And I'll actually show you what I mean with that. If you have a propagated Gaussian Laguerre beam, the psi is mainly a quadratic or a spherical wavefront phase. So here in 3D picture from virtual lab. So, and um, uh, that is this. And the residual phase, this one, that's a vortex. That's exactly what, this kind of angular momentum beams make so interesting, right? So that means this phase is a vortex and this is a smooth part. This can be, that's also different, has different orientations in particular for different components. So it means there's not always like this, but this is for all components the same. And if you add them up, you have the gamma, then you have this. So it means virtual lab is not using in a physical optics modeling this phase, but it's separating this part and this part. That's very, very important. That we call, and this part we sample in a different way than this one. And that is a, a very, very essential in our approach. Now, why is that so important? If you have a little bit of experience with physical optics modeling, you know, this psi is uh, according to Euler function, you can write it like this. And if you like to sample that with the gridded sampling, that means Nyquist sampling, then you see already if the psi has a local gradient, which is for high numerical aperture systems or medium, even for, for big fields, which are paraxial, even then you have the problem that the gradient is fixing the local period. And by that, the local sampling period, it means even if you just need a little bit, because the psi is, has a, a, a big gradient, large gradient somewhere, then you need to sample it everywhere the same because you need a equidistantly gridded sampling. And that that's, uh, is easy that the sampling number is exploding. So we should avoid that. That means another approach or another element of fast physical optics is where possible. Sample instead of this, sample just the smooth psi. Look, this here is easy to sample as a function. But if you sample it on EI psi, you need to sample something like this with the gamma together, right? So, and uh, this, is, um, uh, this is definitely a different story. So it means what we should avoid is sampling the exponential function. It means what we do typically is we sample, if possible, if allowed in a specific step, we need to sample the psi, in the k-domain, the same by the way, sample the psi, uh, we do it gridless, so that means the points are point cloud, and use a suitable interpolation technique, we uh, more and more use a spline interpolation. Now, summary to this point here is, fast optics applies algorithms which are linear in n wherever possible, and a hybrid sampling technique 
which means the UL, that means the residual part, is used for grid sampling, and the psi, we try to sample separately with the gridless sampling. So let's summarize it as this. Our goal to have fast visual optics is algorithms which are linear in N wherever possible, and then also wherever possible, a gridless sampling of the psi instead of an E psi, E I psi, right? So that is what we like to achieve. And here you see already the word wherever possible. And that's a key. That's absolutely key. Because wherever possible means that we need an option to use different modeling techniques in different parts of the optical system. When we just use one technique, then we can skip this question because we have no choice. We have just one modeling technique. And if that's not linear, then not. And if I have a universal solver, it can be, of course, not linear in N because I need a general solver for all microstructures, nanostructures, and so on. I cannot specialize it, right? So that means that is because if I like to achieve that, I must use instead of one technique for the whole system, I must use different techniques. It means a one size fits all modeling technique is absolutely not suitable for fast physical optics. The one size fits all modeling techniques are cool as one ingredient of a modern physical optics software, but not as just one. Approach, right? So it means if you have a system with lenses, prisms, microstructures, gratings, and fibers, and some detectors, then it is not useful to use one technique for all, for example, FDGT. In fact, it doesn't work. Absolutely numerical, no chance. No? So it doesn't work. Um, it can never ever be fast. So it's not a way to do it. It can be very super for this one here, or maybe for a fiber, but not for the whole system. But what we need to do is we need several solvers which are tailored, which are specialized for different components, which are, when possible, specialized in a way that they are linear in N and maybe even allow a sampling of the psi instead of the exponential factor. And then, of course, all these different solvers must be connected. That means the light must be propagated from the source to here, and then all must interact with everything. That means from the very logic, we replace one size fits all physical optic solver by connecting of tailored physical optic solvers. And we do that by the components. That means you don't need to think about it. The components, you take the components from the shelf in your virtual lab, and then you put it into your system and it comes with a specialized solver. We already thought about it. And if you have more solvers, you will have in this year, we will do that uh, consequently. You will have solvers with, you have really components with different solvers where the assistant in virtual lab explains you which kind of component solver combination is best for your purpose or we analyze it even for you. So, and, uh, and then they must be connected. That means the fast user optics approach is inherently a non-sequential modeling technique. It's never sequential. By the way, here I'd like to mention, and maybe Christian can show it also in the demonstration, that the connections you see in the optical system, they are not wires like wires or fibers to connect the sequence. They are just there for relative positioning. That's a little bit misleading. We will definitely change that uh, this year because uh, our approach is non-sequential. These connections are not fixing the light path uh, automatically. That's not the case, just in a special modus, uh, that's the case. Anyway, so it's a non-sequential modeling technique. And this non-sequentiality, you can also control in Virtual Lab already for some time in the channel configuration. There you can say which kind of services should have which kind of channels open, and for gratings, for example, which kind of orders you like to consider. So that means these are channel configurations you can already do where, with which you can control the non-sequential behavior in a very, very, very nice way. So that means the connecting solvers technology, it's absolutely key. That means physical, fast physical optics by connecting solvers because only by using different solvers, we have a chance um, to use solvers which follow our goal to be linear and, and it's not always possible but at least now we have a chance uh, to include solvers which are linear in n and um, now comes a very very essential thing if you think about it a solver which is linear in n that means input point uh, is just one operation to get an output point 
it is quite logical that this kind of operations are typically or often pointwise. And that means pointwise operations are of utmost importance in fast physical optics. And I'd like to explain you now what pointwise operations mean. Pointwise operations are illustrated here. This is a mathematical description. You don't need to follow this now. It is illustrated here. Let's assume these are your gridless sampling points. That's uh, your, your, your mesh where the gridless sampling points are on it. And now pointwise means one point here in the input gives one point in the output. And there is a mapping. The mapping is the row prime uh, is a function of row, row prime. So there, there's a specific mapping. So it means the shape from here to here is mathematically described. Um, or numerically described, typically in virtual life fusion. And the point of separation is a multiplication with the weight. In, in, in physical optics, of course, it's a matrix. We are just simplified with the scalar weight. So that's a pointwise operation. It's a coordinate transformation and a multiplication with the weight. That means the input field is multiplied with the weight and then put to a new position. That is what this equation means here. Okay, so. And this is in contrast to an integral operation. An integral operation, one point contributes to all points more or less in the output. And again, and again, that is what an integral operation is doing with, the with an integral kernel here. It means point-wise and integral uh, is this difference. And it's obvious that the computation complexity on the left side with the number of points is linear in N whereas an integral is quadratic in N. That means the integral is much, much slower than the linear operation. You know that if you use a software, some other software, and you, you use some Huygens integral, for example, and then you, you know that it's quite slowly because then it is n to the power of two instead of a Fourier transform, which is linear in N. Fourier transform is not a pointwise one, but it's linear in N because of the genius of mathematicians. The algorithm is linear in N. So, the same stuff which we do in the X domain can be done in the K domain. So same thing, just reformulated. And I like to uh, mention one thing, which is important to also to see this context is the most trivial point by its operation is the multiplication. Because in the multiplication, of course, you have a weight, that's a multiplication, and the mapping is identical. So you don't change the point, the point remains the same. Now that's, if you have a transmission approach in Fourier optics, for example, it is pointwise. It's a pointwise, but the points are not changed because it's assumed a thin element or something like this, right? So that means what you do in, 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 in a lot of optics books, you have a transmission function, or a reflection function, that is pointwise. That's a multiplication with a function. It's the most trivial pointwise you can do. Interesting is that if you are pointwise in one domain, you know that you have a convolution in the other one. It's a convolution theorem of Fourier mathematics, Fourier transformations. That means that gives us a hint which we use in past physical optics quite often. That in one domain, you can have a very computational heavy operation, but if you go into the other domain, you have a fast one because here it's linear. So that shows you already why it's so important not to work just in one domain, but to switch between the domains because a multiplication of a transmission function, for example, is a linear in X domain, but in K domain, it's a convolution. Whereas propagation, we will see that, is a multiplication in K domain, but a convolution in X domain. So it's very important that for different problems, we go in different domains. And that's also an argument, of course, for connecting solvers, because you need different solvers in different situations of your uh, problem. That means when you do fast visual optics, applies point-wise modeling techniques wherever possible because they are definitely linear in N. And this is enabled because the connecting solvers technology enables us to use different solvers in different domains, see convolution theory. And of course, we can also do approximations uh, and tailor the approximation in a best suited way for a component. And then we will also see, then also very often it's point-wise. It means because of the connecting solvers technology, we get all this beautiful, flexibility and freedom to select the best solver per component to achieve fast modeling with a very high accuracy. So that means the connecting solvers facilitates all what we need to achieve um, in 
fast physical optics. So it means fast physical optics applies point wise modeling techniques wherever possible. Okay, that's always a caveat that I need to say wherever possible, right? So we don't do when it's not possible, of course. Now comes the absolute clue, in my opinion. If you do point wise, then you don't need to do a knife sampling of your wavefront uh, phase because you just do a weight on the phase value, uh, the weight on the, on the field value. That doesn't need a special sampling. That means point wise comes with the additional asset that we can apply a gridless sampling of the smooth wavefront phase psi rho to minimize the end. That means we, we really um, uh, solve this problem here both at the same time when we use um, this kind of approach. It means to summarize this here, a key techniques for fast visual optics are connecting solvers technology, which enables the flexible combination of different solvers in system modeling, which we do by the components in virtual fusion. And by that, it facilitates the use of point-wise solvers, which are extremely important and cool for fast visual optics because they are linear in N. And not only that, because they allow the sampling of the wavefront phase directly instead of the gridded sampling of the psi, they also allow us to work with the small n. So linear and small n, better is not possible. So that's the reason why we are so much interested in point by solvers where possible. That means that is what we do here. So we use different solvers for different components. Not all of them will be pointwise, but uh, quite some. And we can go quite some. We will see today, we, today we just use pointwise solvers, uh, the difference is just the free space propagation in between. I come to this then, of course, next. Now, it means now we have the following situation. We need to investigate in our research and development. We need to investigate solvers for all the different components which we are interested in and our customers are interested in. And here's just uh, something. And we have operators, we have solvers in the K domain and we have operators in the X domain. Actually, we have no in the time domain, so we are just working the K domain and X domain. And they can point wise or integral. If the I use the boundary, if the boundary is a solid, uh, then it's integral. If it's uh, dashed, then it's point wise. So and now let's see what we have. In virtual fusion, now we have this. That means that gives you an overview of solvers we have. So you see most, uh, okay. These are repeated ones, so uh, they are, I, I give you on the next page, I give you uh, um, um, some list of the names, so you don't need to care now about the names too much. So we have different solvers, they are all, all component comes with the name, so it doesn't matter. Uh, now, uh, and you see, yeah, they are all, almost all point-wise, just the LP mode solver for the fibers is an integral solver, but all other ones are point-wise. We will add, this year and the coming time, we will add quite some more solvers. I can already announce that without giving any timeline higher than the, this one. That is easy uh, without any timeline. But I can say we do quite a lot of work, actually. And then you will see there comes more integral solvers also. But still, the working horses in modeling and fast visual optics are pointwise. And uh, so and here are some names. We don't need to go through that now. Uh, you get this material also as a file when you are registered and you get it with the paper, with the um, talk material itself. So that means we have a quite good situation. That means by doing this kind of techniques, by using this kind of technique, we get a situation that we already have quite some point by solvers. And in the demonstration, now Christian will show, he will working mainly with a layer matrix, which is a point wise operator in X, uh, in K domain, and APIA, which is a, here, there are some papers here, you can read them. A very, very uh, powerful technique for curved surfaces. Um, and uh, this is APA, which is also point-wise, but in the X domain. Now, Christian. So thank you very much, Frank, for the very nice introduction and motivation for the connecting solver technology. I hope everyone sees my screen. I think now it's working. Uh, and I prepared a small example to demonstrate uh, how it is accessible in virtual labs, this uh, connecting solver technology, and uh, where we can directly benefit from it. And I selected to, uh, to show you some simulation of an etalon, which means of a, of a few silica blade, which is coated on both sides with an HR coating. Uh, and therefore, I selected uh, 
as a first approach to simulate everything in one server, which means I have here uh, my plane wave, which eliminates the stratified media component. This is a component which is working in the K domain, as Frank mentioned. The solver which is, uh, which is associated to this component is a layer matrix. And in the structure, I specify here a special, I call it HR coded plate. And we can have a look. So uh, there is a sequence of layers uh, from one to six, which is the first AR coating. Then there comes the plate, which is this entry. You see it also from the thickness of the plate. And uh, finally, there's also the other side of the plate coated, uh, which is uh, which are the layers uh, on the bottom of this list. So everything is put into one geometry description and is provided to one solver. I use for the evaluation uh, of the result, I simply use a universal detector, which can provide uh, the electromagnetic field. Uh, and I focus now on the EX component because also polarization is included. You can believe me, but uh, to keep the demonstration as compact as possible, let's focus on the EX component. So I simply simulate the stuff and I get the following results. So you see here's the distribution of the X component. And you see some uh, value at the maximum, which should be now our reference because we simulated with one solver, which is rigorous. So all the multiple inter uh, interference effects and multiple reflection effects are included in the simulation. And now we simply change the configuration and split this uh, optical component specification. So now the, the plate is in the middle between those both components. So we can check the material. So we go from the plane wave, which is defined in air. We go to the front coating, which is then afterwards there comes to silica. Then there comes the back coating and we go back to air. And if we investigate now the coating, again, it's the same component, but with another coating specification. We see now it's only the coating part, which is included here. And now we combine this in a non-sequential way, which means Virtual Lab detects now uh, how the light is propagating through the system and how often the, the light is propagating between those both interfaces or surfaces. And then the resulting fields are provided to the universal detector, which sums up the information. And then we expect or we would expect that the same result comes out. So let's do this. Uh, Okay, what a surprise. Uh, as you can see, exactly the same result comes out with different approaches. We can also check the logging to see what Virtual Lab uh, was doing. And here we see that it uh, identifies that there were several multi reflections. And I see that on the universal detector I used now for evaluation, I see even 18 modes. So all these modes were calculated, all these light paths were evaluated. And then there was a summation done. And then the same result comes out as if I would simulate it with, a, with one solver only. OK, so far so nice. Uh, but what is now the benefit from this? The big restriction is that in the stratified media component, where we apply the S metric solver, everything uh, in the geometry is parallel. If we apply our non sequential connecting solver technology here, we are even free to uh, include also tilts, for example. So for example, uh, let's uh, use uh, now the back coating and introduce some isolated positioning, which means I like to isolate it, rotate the, the second surface a little bit, so only 0 0.1 degree. <coughs> I press OK, I repeat the simulation, and then I get such interesting interference effects, which comes, of course, from the tilt I introduce. Okay, uh, last but not least uh, in this demonstration, uh, let's first turn it back or deactivate the isolated positioning. I will exchange now this, uh, this plane surface with a coating by a curved surface. This I do by simply using a tool to exchange the elements. So here I change now, so both in the first uh, demonstration, both. Uh, both surfaces were, uh, were planes. And now I go to a curved surface. Uh, the curved surface is not curved very, very heavy. So it's uh, 
quite small, so it has only here a, a set extension of 12 micrometers. And here we use another server, which is the LPIA. Frank also introduced that. And if I perform now the simulation here, also with the same configuration I did before, I get another nice uh, interference pattern, which comes also from the smart TV reflections. So you see, it is quite valuable to have uh, not only one solver for one problem, but also to have several solvers which can be uh, combined in a non-sequential way. So far my presentation, I would give back the word to Frank. Yeah, very cool. And uh, I think that shows very nicely a very simple example uh, of the connecting solver technology, which is inherently um, uh, non parallel as you saw. And uh, here in this case, in the first case, we replaced another solver by a split solver uh, for demonstration purpose, just for check of, 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 of the concept. Um, and then we were able to be more flexible by using the tilt and the curve surface. In this concept we are using in a very general way in virtual lab, so it means we are using it for combining a lot of different solvers. Right? That is for the system modeling in the case. Each component comes with a solver and when you calculate through a system, all the solvers are non-sequentially connected whereby you can, the degree of non-sequential behavior you can control by the channels. Now, connecting solvers means connecting and connecting means in praxis you have these propagation steps from the source to the component to the next component forth and back and forth and back inside the component so you have a lot of what we call free space propagation step or homogeneous isotopic media which we call free space propagation you have from source to components detectors uh, and so on so you have different situations of free space propagation that means this solver how to propagate light from one surface to another surface in homogeneous isotopic media is another key solver, which is the kit between all these different component solvers. Now, let's have a look here in the, in the physics of the free space propagation. Um, and you see here, in the free space propagation, you see here that, um, I, I guess most of, of you know that the spectrum of plane wave propagation, you can read it, for example, in Whitman's book um, on Fourier optics. The free space propagation is the Fourier transform of your input component. Then you multiply it with this Kz kappa delta Z kernel, and you do a backward transformation. So that is that can be proven from Maxwell's equations, by the way. And um, now let's consider if you do it this way, what does it mean in computational complexity? Okay, that's a multiplication. No surprise, uh, this is has a complexity of O to N. It's a point pass operation even. It's a point pass operation. The Fourier transform is an integer operator, but it's also point, also it's not point wise, it's an integer operation, but also has a complexity of O N, thanks to the mathematicians. That means a combination has a complexity, uh, computational complexity of O N, thanks to the FFT. That's already very, very good. And we are benefiting from this quite a lot in physical optics modeling. In contrast, if you do this formula, if you do this by convolution theory, you put that into the X domain. So you put this into the X domain, the same mathematic, the same physics, just to formulate in the X domain, that's already Sommerfeld integral. That means already Sommerfeld integral and the left side and the right side are just the same physics formulated in a different domain, that's all. And you see now, because it's convolution theorem, the multiplication here is here, the multiplication, whereas here it's a convolution. And that's the reason why the integral is much, much slower, right? So, but you can do it here. You don't need to do it here, you can do it here. And that's the reason why we do it, of course, here, because we like to work linear in N. Just in very few situations, we use an integral. But uh, if you don't like to calculate one point or two points, then it's, also almost linear in N because we just have two points to calculate, so it doesn't matter. If it's, uh, then it's N to the power of two, it's just if you calculate all points on both sides. But if you just calculate one point in the output, then of course it's again N. Anyway, so I'd like to mention that of course in virtual lab, we cannot only just do parallel planes, which is a standard SPW operator, but you can also do non-parallel planes. Now, that means our free space propagation, it's already a fast algorithm because it's linear in N. And you see here again, 
because we like to be linear in n, we go via the k domain. That means the most important step here is the Fourier transform, the two Fourier transforms. The trouble is that the n can be still quite large because for this, we need to sample the exponential function. That means the FFT algorithm is fast, linear in n, but it requires a gridded sampling of this factor, which can be quite, quite huge. Uh, 10,000 times 10,000, no problem. So it means this is a big issue. So it means how can we avoid that? How we can achieve this behavior? That we can have a gridless sampling of the smooth wavefront phase only and not of this factor. Okay, one way is what we have introduced in Virtual Lab by one of my former PhD students, uh, Chang Chua Wang. He has done a PhD on this uh, topic. Um, we call it semi-analytical Fourier transform, SFT. And this SFT is not solving the problem in full, but it helps because it is uh, taking a quadratic phase polynomial away from the wavefront phase. And then we just need to sample the residual and the quadratic phase factor is dealt in an analytical way on the cost of two FFTs. So we replace one FFT with a large N by two FFTs with a small N. And that is often a big advantage. It means the SFT reduces the gridded sampling quite significantly. And it's rigorous, it's not an approximation at all. These are two algorithms uh, where we do different cost functions uh, and um, thresholds. So it means it's still the problem, it works, it helps a lot, and we use it in Virtual Lab and you do modeling in Virtual Lab, SFT is mainly used, not the FFT, but most often the SFT is used. Mm, and um, because it already helps a lot to reduce the sampling effort, but the FFT and the SFT, at least partly for the residual, still require a gridded sampling of the X function. So there's still something to go. So we don't achieve this. And the question is, can we achieve that? And when can we achieve that? And here comes a demonstration I have shown already quite often. It's also from the PhD work from Chung Chua Wang. And um, this is the following experiment. We are considering how the free transform behaves itself because the free transform is fast because of the mathematicians, but it's not pointwise. The free transform is an integral, right? So it's not a pointwise operation. But we will see now it can behave pointwise. That means the integral operation doesn't contribute a lot to other places just to one point. It's still an integral, but it behaves pointwise. Let's do a demonstration of this. Let's assume we have here a mask like this house. And we illuminate this mask with a spherical wave. Then the field directly behind the mask is this. And then we do a Fourier transform and like to see the result. And we do that with different numerical aperture. I do see a spherical wave. You will see later also, we can also use aberrated wavefront. So it's not restricted to spherical waves at all. But in this example, we use it. Now, now you see here the Fourier transforms. Plane wave and more and more in A, increasing in A. And here you see the typical diffraction pattern of such kind of aperture, right? Here you see still quite some kind of pattern, that's diffraction pattern because it's far field. Uh, I don't discuss that now, but that is a free transform. You know, the free, far field and free transform are directly related. So you see here how this changed. And here you see something interesting. If the NA is large, it has a pointwise behavior. Let's have a little bit of closer look in this example. So that was a point bus operation, right? That means we have here our values and then we can find here our values are just deformed. Now let's take this input and this output, put that in. And then you see it's point wise. This point goes to here and change amplitude a bit. This point goes to here, change amplitude a bit. This point goes to here and so on. You see, it's a mapping, it's a point wise operation, it's deforming, there's a geometric deformation and there are values which change the value. So it means the free transform is an integral, but it can very often in optics behave pointwise. It behaves pointwise. And now comes a very interesting thing. This pointwise behavior can be formulated in a pointwise free transform algorithm. We call it PFT. Pointwise free transform is an algorithm which enables a fast calculation of the weight function f and the mapping. 
So we can calculate the mapping and the weight function fast, very, very fast. And, um, and this is an algorithm we can use now if the Fourier transform behaves point-wise in an approximation. That means if we know the Fourier transform behaves point-wise, then we can replace the FFT SFT algorithms, which are rigorous, by a point-wise Fourier transform algorithm to be even faster and point-wise in the operation, in the mathematical, physical, optics operation. And the good news now is, of course, that because it's point-wise, as mentioned before, I don't need an accurate sampling of the exponential factor, but I can use a gridless sampling of the psi itself. Just to comment it, what is the criterion, rule of thumb criterion, uh, to have this situation, the rule of thumb criterion is that the phase, wavefront phase, um, if I consider the cosine of the wavefront phase, I have a fluctuation, and this fluctuation must be stronger than the modulation of the residual. And uh, this can be measured, we don't need to discuss it here much more, uh, but that happens in optics quite often. And in particular, if the waveform phase has a strong gradient, that means in particular in higher NA situations or medium NA situations also. Um, and in fact, in most lens situations, um, um, uh, this happens. And uh, then we can um, replace the rigorous FFT and SFT algorithms by the approximate PFT algorithm. Because it's a pointwise algorithm, with less sampling of the psi with a very small N. It means the PFT algorithm is linear in N, but in particular fast, because the N can be kept very small. Now, that is, of course, quite something. In inversal fusion, now we do the following. We operate for the free space propagation, where we do the Fourier transforms. We operate with three Fourier transform algorithms. It's always the same Fourier transform, of course, mathematically speaking, but we use different algorithms. We use the FFT algorithm, as everybody is doing, but we are using also the SFT algorithm and, in particular, the PFT algorithm. And the fusion selects the algorithm for forward and inverse um, Fourier transform separately. And we do it by uh, compromising the lowest computation effort to the sufficient accuracy. In the case of SFT, PFT, we just take the numerical effort because they are both rigorous. But if you use PFT, we do also um, the accuracy check. So let's go a little bit into detail here. That, because that's very important if you use Virtual Lab that you know what's going on here. By the way, all the things can be monitored. We will see very soon. Now, if you take in Virtual Lab at some place in the editor or somewhere, you take all free transforms, you select all. Then Virtual Lab decides for you which is used. Okay, so, and how do we do that? First, we evaluate if the free transform behaves, or both free transforms at, uh, corresponding um, respectively, if they behave pointwise. And for this, we have introduced what we call a pointwise transformation index, PTI. We will develop a white paper on the PTI that you get a little bit theoretical background of it. It's some related to the Fresnel number, but it's a more general concept. So it's a more general concept than the Fresnel number, you can say that. So, the pointwise transformation index. The default threshold value for the PTI is one, that is our internal calibration of that. And for the PTI larger than one, so the transformation index says it behaves point-wise, then we use a PFT algorithm. If not, not, okay? The threshold value can be, of course, adjusted uh, in by the user. So, but this works quite well already. In the second step, if the PTI is smaller than this threshold, then the PFT cannot be used. Then we estimate the computational effort of FFT and SFT, and we use the one which is faster, uh, means which is less computational effort. If, we, if you select just the FFT and SFT, then we just calculate, uh, just estimate the effort and use the one which has smaller one. If you just use PFT, and then we use a PFT, of course, only independent of any PTI value. Then we enforce the use of the PFT. And uh, you can customize it completely um, and uh, you can select what you like there uh, if you have any reason to do this kind of thing. Then we have this situation for different groups, source to component, component to component, and inside component. We found it's very useful in applications to do that separately. 
um, because, for example, if you go into a focus and detectors in the focus, it's a special situation. When you are lenses, you have components, then it's a different situation. So that means it's quite nice to have this in a different way. If you do everything automatic, in fact, we would not be needed, but we have it. You will see the accuracy can be adjusted for the PFT um, uh, switching. Now let's go to the logging. In the logging, we have added now in the new version, we have added uh, all these dialogues in a new way and everything is much more uh, transparent now. And we also added very clearly that you see always in the modeling what is used. So you see in the modeling here, that's just an example of the logging. Point-wise fluid transform is used with just 1,000 sampling points. That's very low, right? That is just uh, 100 times 10 or 30 times 30. That's very, very, very small. And um, so, and um, 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 duration here, yeah, it's negligible, obviously. And um, the point wise transformation index, PTI, is 2.5. The threshold was one. So that's the reason why the point wise fluid transform is used. And then we also give the information if the mapping is bijective. Um, then it's very nice. Uh, if it's not bijective, it's also possible, but it's just an additional information because you can exclude the use of the PFT, PFT if it's not bijective. Anyway, so then you see here, it's again point-wise because still two. Then you go to the next step, there's another component, another propagation. Here again, 2.0, it seems all the same, but then we are here somewhere in another plane. And then you see the inverse fast fluid transform algorithm, the inverse FFT is used, uh, also with quite small sampling number, um, and also very, very fast because it's small sampling number and fast. And uh, the PTI was just 0.04, that's completely too small, and we use uh, FFT algorithm. So that is very transparent, you can see what happens, you see where maybe time is used. Uh, if, for example, here is a very heavy FFT somewhere, and uh, 10,000 10, points, but it's just maybe 0.9, then you can may say, ah, now, I use here the PFT also, then you can select PFT there and you are much faster, good. So this can all be controlled in the new version in the profile editor and uh, by tools and um, um, different tools we have there. So you have different ways to control these things in a very simple way or in a sophisticated way. Any level is uh, possible. I like to mention something just for completeness, not that you need to know it, uh, that you need to use it, uh, but it's uh, interesting to know. As I already mentioned, the, this algorithm here, it's nothing else than the Rolly Sommerfeld integral. That means when we do this here, with the SFT is even faster, then we have a fast implementation of the Rolly Sommerfeld integral from a physics point of view. Okay, but we do it, of course, in the K-domain, but it's a say, just convolution theory. Right, that's all. And a very fast FFT. So that's a fast Rolly Sommerfeld integral. If you use this combination, forward is an FFT, SFT, and backward is a PFT, then you assume the general far field integral. Here's a paper to that. You can read it in detail. If you use first the PFT and then the FFT, SFT, that is this configuration, then you use the generalized Debye integral. Also, paper to that. Right, it's discussed in detail. And then if you use just point-wise, then you have a point-wise electromagnetic field propagation, uh, which is also discussed here in a paper by Olga um, about um, how this is generalization, ray optical thinking, and so on. So that is also very, very important to see. So I'd just like to mention this, that things you know are of course included. That means by switching the Fourier transforms automatically in virtual lab via the PTI, you switch also between fast implementations of this kind of integrals here, uh, in particular because they are all faster than normal, uh, even uh, because um, we have this SFT included, um, and um, and we also have the PFT generalized than what the typical formulas are. But you can read the papers to see the context more. Now, that means what we do now is we select the free transform algorithms in a modeling. That means we have a modeling, we need propagation here, and everywhere you need to check what kind of free transforms you have. You can do that in the editor per detail, or you can do it more generally. So there are different ways to do that. And uh, typically you start with the point-wise selection for all to be get a first fast physical optics result, right? And then you can go to automatic or whatever you like. You will see examples for this also in demonstration. 
It means for all the free space propagation steps, the forward and the buffered field transforms algorithm must be selected manually or automatically. And uh, then we consider that from the result, then we have all these combinations are somehow an integral of the propagation, right? Uh, even if the point plus field transform is combined with the FFT forward and backward, then the whole propagation is an integral. Like I said, for example, in this case, uh, far field integral. And uh, so we have integral, or if both are, then we have point wise. So it means dependent on your configuration or the automatic selection, you might have a full integral propagation here, or you might have a mixed type, that is normal, by the way, that you have a mixed type, so partly are point wise, some are integral. Or you also can, of course, have or enforce it or have it a poor point-wise one. Now, that are the free space propagation steps. And now we come to the solver per component. And here, lens is in the solver. Let's take the solvers from here and put them to the components. Now you see this is point-wise, this is point-wise, this is point-wise, this is point-wise, this is integral. That means you see now that in the modeling, we have achieved the following, that we have point-wise sequences, which are particular fast to model. By the way, the FMM itself has, a, has, of course, an algorithm included, which is not always fast. It depends on the grading period. But here we mean the application of the result to the field. And that's point-wise. The solver itself, to calculate, it, um, to calculate the S matrix here, uh, can take some time. APIA is using a coating matrix, which is fast. This is, can be slower, but we also use lookup tables here. It means they are there. So it means in any way, it's point-wise as a whole situation. And um, the shortest one maybe is this one. You come from, uh, from like Etalon, as Christian have shown, and you go with a point-wise step to your sensor. So, and you can also have a full sequence from the source to the detector, um, uh, which is point-wise. So that means we have more or less many point-wise sequences dependent mainly on the free transform selections. What do a point-wise modeling sequence now provide? What, what, is, a, what is so cool with this point-wise uh, sequences when we achieve them? Yeah, okay, first of all, modeling speed. Yeah, they are linear in N, and we don't need a large n because they are linear in n, n small n by grid assembling of wave and phase instead of the EI psi rho. You see, for fast physical optics, the hybrid sampling, that means the different sampling of parts of the field. Some parts are sampled equidistantly, some parts are sampled gridless uh, with spline interpolation, other techniques. This combination, which is very tricky, by the way, um, Christian could say a lot about it, how that looks like in detail, but of course, we don't talk about this too much, but that is quite a heavy stuff to put these things together. But for the user, it doesn't matter. For the user, it's a point by sequence, which is simply fast to model. Um, and uh, this is a particular fast result. So it means if we come to our answer, how to make physical optics modeling fast, then we see, Connecting solvers is the most important thing. It enables the usage of tailored solvers per component. The solvers should be selected in a way where possible that the computation complexity for the field operations, maybe there are some other values needed some time to calculate, they are stored somewhere, but for the field uh, um, application, we should have a computation complexity linear in the number of sampling points wherever possible. That is exactly what we can apply. Then the point by solvers are of particular uh, interest uh, because they are linear in the number of n and they allow a small number of n because of this special type of sampling of the wavefront phase. And because the free transform to switch between the domains, which is important for having solvers in k and x, the free transform itself that's an important breakthrough understanding, can also approximately behave point-wise, and then it justifies the usage of the particularly fast point-wise Fourier transform algorithm. And these are very, very important ingredients for making physical optics modeling fast. And um, I uh, then come, of course, to the question um, how now this is related to general optics, but I think Question now, I think your demonstration should come here, right? 
or not yet? Not yet, no, no, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So uh, now, now comes of course the question. Um, uh, now we know how to make it fast, and I promised you that if you answer this question well, and we did it now, that then we see how general optics is embedded in physical optics in a practical, accessible, controllable way. Now let's have a look. This is a very simple system, but just an illustration, right? Now let's assume you have a modeling, you have this system would be completely uh, point by sequence. Let's assume it's a, maybe it's a part of a, of a sequence or here it's a full sequence from source to detector, right? So then you start with some points. These are is your point wise propagation, right? And then you have a free space propagation, which is point wise. Then you end up on your surface. Yeah, on the surface, we have again points because we have a, this kind of propagation. Then you apply APIA. That's a pointless operation. Now I assume the positions are not changed, which is, by the way, not always correct. Typically, also this changes. Think about the Gauss-Hankinship for total reflection. Then you could have also a shift of these points. But now let's assume the points remain the same. Now you have again your pointless propagation, again a surface, again APIA. Then you propagate again to the grating, again point-wise, again a mapping. Now you are here on the grating. Now you apply the Fourier modal method per order, which is point-wise. Here I definitely say I cannot just start here again. I must start somewhere else. So it means this operator gives me where I have my next mapping points. Then I again forward propagation. I have again my points. So that is what physical optics modeling means if I do a point-wise sequence. And of course, if you know uh, here in the detector, then I have all my electromagnetic field values on enough values here. Now I have just three, but let's say there are much, you saw the example was 1000, for example, I have shown you. And now you have electromagnetic field values, all the six field components, you do it for all the six field components. Uh, you have all the results, you have interpolation technique. So you get your electromagnetic field values on your detector grid. So you get a full electromagnetic field result. But of course, you could also just consider the points. Where are the points? And if you consider the points in the output, then you get this. And that's what you know from a ray optical result. That's a dot diagram. A dot diagram gives you the points. It says to you how these points are mapped to the output. That's what you expect from a ray optical thinking, right? But you see here, the physical optics thinking also has that because of the point by sequences. That means if you skip the field information and you just consider the mapping itself, then you get the dot diagram. But keep in mind that in physical optics, we don't do any kind of uh, the standard ray tracing here. Um, that is just another algorithm to do the same thing. That is a little bit too much to discuss now. Uh, but doesn't matter. It's still linear in N. We just have linear operations in N. That's the same computation effort as you have in ray tracing. Uh, but for example, in ray tracing, you would never ever be able to do this, right? Because you have no information about this mapping here. So you cannot do ac accurately enough, by the way. Uh, so there are some shifts, like Gauss-Hainton shift, GUI phase shift, other shifts are not included in the standard ray tracing approach. In this approach, all is included. So all the shifts are included. Everything is accurate. Even the positions are more accurate than if you would do a, a ray tracing is a conclusion of this. Physical optics explains how ray tracing should be done. Because you could calculate, you can connect these points now, and then you see a direction. So you can say, I know the direction now after I know the mapping, and then I can trace to here to find this. That's just another algorithm. Okay, so you get this result. And now let's put that all away. Let's assume you have all these mapping results because you did physical optics. You know the field values, you know, now I connect them. And then you have what you are knowing from here. That's all. That means the point by sequences, when you do where in the system where that's allowed, it depends on the point by Fourier transform and if your operator is point wise. If the Fourier transform is not point wise, then that's not allowed. Then you would maybe from here to here, you would skip it. Then you maybe from here to here, you have it. But maybe from here to here, you have it not, right? For example, if you would stop here in a focal plane, you definitely won't have it. So you cannot do this, right? You would, so we would not show that because it's not existing. Um, but um, uh, if you enforce a point by Fourier transform, of course, you can even do this. So it means 
the ray tracing picture you know are uh, directly available in physical optics modeling for all the point by sequences, you have that under control, and then you can show it. That's what we do in Virtual Lab. And I like to emphasize the the mapping here is more accurate than in standard ray tracing. Uh, there are several reasons to do that. We will definitely discuss it in more detail later in this year in more theoretical uh, uh, contributions. Uh, but this is, a, for example, you can see it easily here, right? Or if you have a coating, if you're coating, then the ray is not going out in the same position. It goes somewhere out that's just small. But if you have high-end numerical, high-end uh, lens systems, for example, that's assumed for wafer stepper technology and so on. Of course. Companies like Zeiss include these shifts in the modeling to get all the aberrations uh, they have. And that is, um, of course, included here. Anyway, so it means what the full and partial point-wise modeling sequences give us also is that we have access to the mapping. And the mapping gives us access to dot diagrams everywhere here. So we can put detectors everywhere here and see the dot diagram. And you can also see a 3D picture of the connections, which then it's called ways. But in fact, it's just an illustration of the mapping, right? So it means pointer sequences in physical optics modeling provide a sequence of mappings in space domain. The visualization of this mapping sequence reveals the results known from ray optics here. And that means a seamless control of the pointwise sequences in physical optics modeling, which we discussed others via the visualization of the resulting mapping, access to ray optical results inside the physical optics modeling framework. That's what we are doing. That's the reason why general optics is always accessible. We just need to configure the modeling in this way. And the good news is, if you do it automatically, by automatically selection of the Fourier transform in particular, then Virtual Lab decides for you where a ray optical visualization is allowed. Uh, and that is, in our opinion, extremely cool. That means, to show it in this picture, physical optics modeling in our concept means we have always dealing with E and H with the field. We have a most important subset in our, inside physical optics modeling, which is point-wise modeling sequences. It doesn't mean the whole system typically, but just a part of the optical system. But anyway, there is a part, more or less big. And if we skip the electronic filter formation and we consider just the mapping, then we have what we know as way optical results. That's the reason that now in the new version, we call this profile not ray tracing anymore because we don't do. But we call it way optical results because we do a physical optics modeling and do this step to show you what you know from ray optics. But we do it on the basis of physical optics, which is, as I said, and we will discuss this year more, uh, even more accurate for this. I'd like to show you, before Christian is uh, showing his demonstration, I'd like to show you a very simple example, step by step, uh, to give this a little bit a practical feeling. So it's a very simple situation. I have a plane input field, and I just calculate the focus. So it's a spherical lens here. Now. Let's model it. I have first the free space step. I have LPIA to model all the surface here and this surface. I like to calculate detector um, result behind and in the focus. OK, so I like to see here and here. And now I have, of course, um, a collimated light. So first, I have the propagation to the lens. Let's assume I select point by free transform here, so I enforce the use of a point by sequence. I don't check now if that's true. Then I have the point by LPIA here. Then I do the propagation here. I also enforce point wise. Now I do that. So, and um, this enforcing point wise, I do in Virtual Lab in our new version now in this kind of tool. So I can say source to component point wise and to detector point wise. So these are the two free transforms here. And this means I calculate in a point by sequence. Obviously, everything's point wise, point wise. And now I can do this. And how to do that in virtual fusion 2023.1? 20, 
we have in our editor, and Christian will show that also, we have this window, this uh, um, gridless data window, gridless uh, data uh, tab, and I emphasize it here, so I magnify it. And there you can say, don't show me the interpolated values on the gridded data uh, of the data detector, but show it me, show me the points as they come. That means the point-wise ones. And show me just the positions. If you have the positions, you can also see the directions in the waveform phase uh, as you are knowing it from way optical thinking. So we allow that. So if I do this and I do the visualization for a system, that's another approach we do now. We visualize the thing. Then we get our standard ray tracing picture um, now with the background I gave you before. Now, if you go to detectors, then we get, of course, our dot diagrams. So. That is was done now in this configuration. This configuration can be done in the general profile we have. Each system comes with two profiles, general profile and the rare results profile. The rare results profile, this setting is pre-configured. So you can do that at once. It's assumed that you like to do that. In the general profile, you can also do it because the general profile, but you need to adjust it. You need to configure it as I have shown. Now let's go into, let's forget the skipping of field values. Now let's say I'm working still in this point by sequence. I'm still here inside here, but I like to see the field values. And that is what I need to do in the general profile. So now I say not only positions, but I like to see the field values. Okay, again, I do it, just detectors, and then I get this. Then you get the points, but with field values. I could go now with E, X, E, Y, E, Z, H, X, H, Y, H, Z. So you get all the field values. You see here, very nice to do a hexapolar sampling here. Um, let's call it the exit pupil if you like, and this is a focal plane. And now I um, say, I don't like to see just the grid, gridless point. I like to see the interpolated version. So I like to interpolate now. Then you say not yes here, then you say no here. And then you get this. Okay, this is now, there's not a lot of action here in the uh, field behind the lens, so it's clear. Um, and in the focal plane, you get some crazy stuff. Why you get crazy stuff? Yeah, because the mapping is not really justified there, right? You are in the focal plane, you have caustics there and all this stuff. So it's not a, not a good idea to do a point by three transform here in the focal plane. In fact, it's not allowed. If you would see that, um, um, then you would see that the PTI is not satisfying. But I enforced it by point-wise. So that means I like to see now the real focal plane. So I go from point-wise, I go to not point-wise. So I leave now my point-wise modeling sequence. I go to the full physical optics thinking by asking here for automatic. So here I do now automatic. If I do automatic, then the Schlepp decides about the Fourier transforms. And then I get this result. All the same. Always very fast here. Then I get this result. Then I can do the same. I can do also here automatic, just to see what happens. Then you see there are a little bit diffraction here on the way, but not a lot. So that's not really important, right? So that's exactly what you know from lens systems. Here, the first part is not so important. Uh, that can be done point-wise, but if you go to the focal plane, in particular, the last three transform uh, cannot be approximated by a point-wise three transform, but must be done more general. And now, Christian. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I think the example you showed is uh, already quite impressive, but uh, I selected another one, a little bit more uh, application-oriented uh, example, to discuss uh, the same things uh, you explained in the, uh, in the discussion before. So what I'd like to uh, show you in this example is a wafer inspection system, which is one of our, let's say, standard sample files. Uh, here, a uh, Gaussian wave uh, illuminates a uh, 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 high A lens system, and uh, we can have a look what is happening. So in the focus, there is here a grating, which is uh, illuminated with, uh, in this focal plane. The grating generates some orders, which propagates back through the lens system, and finally we do some focusing uh, to calculate the image of that. And what I'd like to do with you now together is to investigate the things step by step. So the first thing I'd like to investigate now is the field directly after the lens system. So after I propagate my Gaussian beam through the lens system in the focal plane. 
I already prepared it to see how it looks like. So I activate now only this detector. Uh, in the detector, uh, I configured already that uh, I like to get the grid list data and that I like to get only the positions, directors, and the reference phase. Uh, what Frank also explained in a very nice way uh, is the configuration of our pointwise sequences, which you can find in the ribbon uh, at the top. And if I perform now the simulation, then I get this result, which means I get the spot diagram or dot diagram in the focal plane of my uh, quite complicated lens system. So I'm now directly here in this plane. Maybe to say also short something to the components we are using uh, here, the objective lens, uh, as I said, is a quite complicated lens system and we simulate it with, uh, with uh, the LPIA solver. And later when I do also the propagation uh, backward through the lens system, we will apply also some FMM technology. Okay, as I said, back to the detector result, I get this information, which means I have now access to the positions. I can also check, for example, the wavefront phase, make it a little bit large, uh, the dots a little bit larger. So I get already some information, but as Frank also showed in his, uh, his demonstration, let's have a look what the field values are doing. And therefore I simply go here to uh, not show only the positions directly in the wavefront phase, but also to show the field values. Uh, and let's have a simulation of this also quite fast. I make the positions, uh, the, the, the positions or the dots a little bit larger that you can see it better. Also the color, I will adapt a little bit in the view. And now I have access to the EX component, to the EY component. Okay, in this example, say look quite the same, but this comes because I have a circular colorized uh, Gaussian field. So it is expected that they are the same. And I have already some information about the uh, uh, AC component uh, in this focal plane. And as a next logical step, as Frank also did uh, his uh, documentation of this uh, example, let's have a look how this looks in an interpolated way. Therefore, I simply go again to the detector I'm interested in, and I select the grid list data table. And here I select now that I like to see not the grid list data, but I like to see as an interpolated one. Then I repeat the simulation once more. Okay, the result is not looking completely different besides that we don't see points now with information, but that we see uh, an interpolated version of it. Um, so we have also access, because I defined it this way, to the EX, EY, and the EZ component. Okay, but of course, uh, I'm here in the focal region of, uh, uh, of the uh, for, for my investigation. So I also like to do now an automatic propagation to the to the to the focal plane and therefore i simply change here in the ribbon i say i like to have automatic propagation i repeat the simulation and then i get this let's uh, synchronize first the uh, color lookup tables and compare it with this result so here we have the x component calculated by point points and here have, we have calculated it by um, by the automatic selection it is important to see now that the sizes are completely different. And this comes because of diffraction, of course. So here we speak of a size of, let's say something about one micrometer. Here we are in the nanometer range. Even if the distribution looks equal, uh, the sizes are of course completely different. Okay, as I said, we can also switch through the other components. The X and Y are the same more or less. And we can also check the EC component uh, let's have a look at the interpolated version. So quite nice. So let's close the results for this uh, first investigation plane and have a look in another plane of interest. So I, now I like to see the field which is provided or which is calculated directly after the uh, uh, after the uh, calculations through the lens system, uh, which means first the virtual lab calculates through the lens system. Then it interacts with the grating and then it calculates back through the lens system. And then I like to calculate the field. Therefore, I simply activate another well prepared detector, of course. Uh, 
And uh, this detector is also configured initially that I like to have first the crypt information only for points, uh, for positions and directions in the wavefront phase. So this is the result I get from this. You can imagine, so uh, this value is now here, this value is here, and this value is here. And I can nicely see where my positions are. And I can also change, of course, this information of the wavefront and also the directions. But now let's have a look how this looks like when I investigate the field values also. Therefore, once again, I go to the detector. I click on, I like to see also the field values for Critless data. And I press uh, once more the simulation. So maybe it should be also stated that all the simulations are here done, of course, live. Uh, so there's nothing pre-calculated or done before. Uh, so you see it's really fast. And here you see now each mode has a different subset of a gridless data array. You can zoom in that you see also that it's gridless. And uh, we have also access, let's stay with this mode, for example, we have also access for, for this order of the grating. Uh, which is propagating through the through the objective lens through the different feed components the x and y are still quite similar and the set of course is also available and now of course uh, as you as you saw um, we have now different modes which illuminate the detector and currently these modes are shown independently but of course the detector is also the option to show the uh, the fields together in one uh, detector window. And this can be simply activated by going in the edit dialog of the universal detector and on the field quantity tab, you can simply select some, so, uh, some initial coherent modes. And if you activate this, then of course uh, you close the dialog that you accept the changes and you perform the simulation again. And here you see now, all three modes together. So this is the first order, or minus first order. This is the zeroth order of the grading, and this is plus or minus first order, depending on the definition of the uh, order sign. And now you see all of this is given in one data array. But because of the situation that we decided now that we like to have a summation of the fields, Virtual Lab automatically decides, OK, gridless data I cannot show. That's the reason why it automatically goes to interpolated data and uh, shows the result in one detector window. Also here, let's make it a little bit larger. Also here we can go nicely through the feed components. This is the EX component. This is the EY component. Here it's already interesting because here we see that uh, the EX and the EY component are not the same. And this of course comes from the polarization dependent properties of the, of the grating. Uh, so uh, initially it was circular polarized and now we see uh, that there is a quite some difference between the X and the Y component. And we can also check the Z component, which looks like this. Uh, maybe also important to say the Z component here is quite small in comparison uh, to the other both components. Uh, so here we speak about 0 0.1 volt per meter and here we speak about the micro volt per meter. Um, to visualize this uh, even better, we have a nice tool to make the scaling of such a data array uh, equal. Therefore, we simply click this button, and now all the subsets are scaled in the same way, and we can switch through them. And as you can see, if we scale it in the same way, the EZ component is quite zero or quite small, but it's included in the simulation. Okay. Let's have a final look at the, at the image plane of, uh, uh, of the imaging lens we like to investigate. So remember, this is our setup. We go uh, here through this uh, objective lens. Then we have these three orders, which uh, are propagating through the imaging lens. And in uh, quite some distance of half a meter or something like this, we like to calculate the focal region once again. Therefore, I activate simply the, late, uh, the last detector which is through the target plane. Uh, also here, I decided first to have a look at uh, no, where is it? the critless data only with positions and directions. So let's do this. 
And then you see something like this, which looks quite weird, but which comes simply from what happens uh, during the pointless, uh, pointwise propagation through the lens system. So we have quite some truncation effects, for example, and also let's say some small aberrations, but as you can see, the, the aberrations here are quite small. Uh, we have also access to the, to the wavefront phase. Okay, I showed already before. Now let's have also a look uh, at the summation of the fields. Also here we have three modes. Of course, I could show you also the critical data with field values for the mode independently, but let's directly calculate the sum of the current modes uh, directly, and then we see the following. Uh, then we some, see something like this. So we have here our three modes. This is again the first and the minus first order, the zeros order of situating. I have now also configured in the universal detectors that I like to have access to the EX, Y, EZ, HX, HY, and HZ component. So I can nicely switch between them. Um, but of course, again, we are in the focal region. So it is quite important here also to activate also the automatic propagation selection for the propagation from the, from the last component to the detector. And if we do this, then we get a quite nice interference pattern because we configured already uh, that everything should be combined. And then we get something like this. So we see here the interference pattern of the three beams. Um, let's make for the demonstration further discussion, uh, discussion of the, the window of the detector a little bit smaller so that we see only the details. If we repeat the simulation once more. So we see now here the EX component of this interference pattern, the Y component, and the EZ component. Also, the H field can be accessed. And as a final, uh, let's say, sneak peek to also the webinar for tomorrow, I'd like to show you now also that we can easily calculate from this data also in uh, irradiance, for example, uh, to see also the stuff, uh, for example, in not in real colors, this is not possible because we have here some uh, infrared situation. And then we see now here's the calculated irradiance. Uh, let's have a look in the false color mode. And uh, we see how the interference pattern is built out. Uh, the interesting aspect, I did not show too much in detail, uh, the creating we are eliminating is uh, not symmetric. And this also causes this asymmetric interference pattern uh, in the plane we are currently investigating. So you see, everything is uh, quite nice to control via our control button uh, for the propagation. And the universal detector also allow access to ray optical results, pointless or critless uh, data with field values or without field values, but also interpolated values. So it's quite flexible. And uh, I think I could also show it is quite uh, fast for simulation. So back to Frank. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's in, uh, it's indeed shows uh, for this kind of uh, big lens system as the grating included. The grating is simulated rigorously via FMM. I think that should be emphasized again. Um, and so you see everything's very fast yeah, because the whole modeling is point-wise besides the last Fourier transform in the focal plane. There we need to, the automatic algorithm would switch. You would see if you have automatic um, use uh, there, then you will see that this is the critical Fourier transform in this modeling and um, that works well. So it means here you saw a connecting solvers, the lenses via LPIA, each surface via LPIA, the grating uh, via free modal method rigorously, mm, and there was a little bit of plane, some beam splitter that is layer metrics. So a lot of solvers connected, uh, they are all working in a point wise manner because they are like that um, in the K domain or in the X domain. And then the free transforms um, are selected point wise or automatic, and then you get all the results. That's it. That means you don't need to do all of this. It just shows, um, because I have shown it just to, to show the examples. Now, final step, and that is the end of the webinar. I'd like to give one more interpretation. I go to the question, what is the physical meaning of uh, point-wise versus integral modeling for the free space propagation? I'd like to give another interpretation, um, and uh, this is about diffraction. 
that's one basic effect in um, uh, physical optics modeling, of course. Let's have a very compact look in that. Uh, it's not a long part here. I, I can do it quite fast. Let's consider the typical standard approach when diffraction is discussed in books. It's always about the same situation. It's always about you have an aperture, and then you consider the light propagation behind the aperture. In diffraction is defined to say, okay, in a geometrical thinking, there is just light going through where the aperture is open, and there's no light in the so-called geometrical or geometric shadow. That means no light in the shadow means no diffraction. So that is understanding of a geometrical thinking, just straight. And diffraction means there is light in the geometric shadow. Just an illustration here. That is what diffraction means, right? That means it's a propagation issue. It means if the light propagates and there goes light into the shadow, then it is diffraction, what we call diffraction. The same happens also if you have a spherical wave, then the shadow is a little bit more complicated because it goes, light goes geometrically through. And diffraction here also means I have diffraction um, inside the shadow. So that's the definition of diffraction, nothing else. That is the definition of diffraction, and that's what you find in books. Now, let's talk about the magnitude of diffraction. The magnitude of diffraction means how much energy of the light goes by diffraction into this geometric shadow. That depends, of course, on the propagation distance. That means the position of the optical axis. That means the magnitude of diffraction is a, is a function of the position. Uh, that depends uh, how, where you are. Now, what's the modeling of this? What's the modeling of the standard diffraction problem? The modeling goes, you can go into textbook now, or you can just apply what we have discussed in this webinar. You can take your incident wave, plane wave or cycle one. Then you model your aperture. The aperture is modeled, is typically modeled by a truncation. If it's a very, very small pinhole, then you need something more. But in standard uh, aperture, we just use a truncation. That is what in textbooks uh, is just that inside where the aperture is closed, there's no light, and where it is open, it goes through. It's also called the Kilhurst boundary condition of the aperture modeling. So that's a very simple model of apertures, which is widely used, also in diffraction theory, right? So then you have the free space propagation behind the aperture to the screen. That is our standard. That means the behavior of the Fourier transforms decide about the magnitude of the diffraction. It's not uh, that, that there, we, there we see it. Okay, the truncation decides about also in the sense about how much how big the light is. But then to see it in the modeling, it's about the Fourier transforms, and it's very clear. The more both Fourier transforms behave pointwise, the smaller the magnitude of diffraction is. Because if it's point-wise, then it's just the shadow, the dramatic shadow. It's just the mapping, which we will see then. Um, whereas when the free transforms don't behave very point-wise, then there are diffraction effects. This can be generalized to any component, not just an aperture. We have always the same situation. We have some effect of a component. This component is changing my field. And then in the free space propagation, there is diffraction. That means the change is generating something which goes um, more or less away from a given mapping. That means that is by the both free transforms behave pointwise, then there is not a big magnitude and otherwise not. That means when we do a modeling in this configuration for what as a so fully integral, then diffraction is always included because we don't care about the pointwise behavior. It means diffraction is always included in free space propagation independent of its magnitude. If the magnitude is wrong, uh, small, I do integral. If it's um, uh, big, I do integral. There's no change. Uh, I do always full inclusion of diffraction, independent if it's important or not, or if I like to see it. If I do pointwise free transform by enforcement, then I exclude diffraction on the way in the free space propagation independent of the magnitude of diffraction. So I also don't see diffraction, which is important. Christian has shown that in his examples very nicely, that um, sometimes uh, it was no problem, but in the focal planes, of course, the last free transform is not pointwise here. And then um, he 
the, the, the mapping was uh, not showing the right thing, right? If we do automatic, then we have a very, very clear concept. Then we include diffraction if the point wise transformation index leads to um, uh, that both three transforms are below the specified threshold, both must be. Uh, um, um, when one is just point wise, not enough, both must be point wise. And the diffraction is excluded um, if it's too small concerning to this PTI. That means automatic is selecting for you if diffraction is included in the modeling or not, according to the magnitude of diffraction. If it's small, it's not connect, it's not concluded, it's not included, and so on. That means this PTI is an indirect way also to estimate the magnitude of diffraction and by that to include it in the modeling or not. So what's the meaning, physical meaning of uh, the point by special integral modeling for free space propagation also? Yeah, it's an inclusion of diffraction. That means the free transform settings for free space propagation allow a seamless control of the inclusion of diffraction dependent on its magnitude. And the diffraction is exactly the thing which is making the difference between a point-wise mapping, like the shadowing for the base, most basic diffraction problem, and the integral one, which is then called the Huygens principle, you know, of course, that's an integral then. And the Huygens principle at each point is sending a spherical wave out, and then you have the um, um, integral situation, which we, of course, implement fast thanks to the FFT. Now, final demonstration. Christian, your turn. Absolutely. Let's have a final demonstration of the inclusion of diffraction, as Frank introduced already. <clears throat> Therefore, I prepared two systems. Uh, one is uh, quite easy. Uh, this is a spherical wave where I eliminate an aperture and in some distance I like to investigate the field. Uh, for the free uh, for the for the free space uh, propagation to the detector I select, it should be used always as the automatic configuration. And in the first way, I use a quite uh, I use a spherical wave with quite a large uh, radius of curvature, which is here 100 uh, millimeters. And the aperture I like to illuminate is one millimeter by one millimeter, and it has a relative edge width of 3%. And if I perform now the simulation, Virtual Lab is automatically evaluating everything because I select it automatically. I get here some really nice diffraction pattern, and I can check nicely also the logging, what has happened, what happened, and what Virtual Lab decides. So we see. Which lab decided here to use a point by uh, fast uh, fast Fourier transform uh, because the PTI was quite small, and for the inverse propagation, uh, semi-analytical uh, inverse Fourier transformation was used. And now I changed uh, I changed simply the radius of curvature for the spherical wave to be not 100 millimeter but to be uh, one millimeter. Uh, which means uh, this is equal to the example Frank showed with the, with the house at the beginning. So I increase the NA for the elimination. And if I perform now the same simulation with the same system again, you see there is not really a diffraction effect one could see. So it is uh, somehow a mapping, of course. Uh, and we can also check some, the logging for this. So as expected, which lab decided two times to select uh, Point-wise Fourier transformation, and uh, for the inverse uh, Fourier transformation, of course, inverse point-wise Fourier transformation. We also get access for the PTI. So this is, uh, let's say, the far field of uh, the, the aperture uh, of the current configuration. And as Frank already mentioned, uh, the point-wise Fourier transformation is not only capable to handle spherical waves, but it's also possible to uh, include also aberrations. And therefore, I decided that I like to include this also in this demonstration. Uh, I prepared a small uh, component, which introduces simply some uh, some some sonic acidal aberrations, which I pre-configured. And if I perform now the same simulation again, you remember this result, and I perform the simulation once more, then you see which lab uh, can even with the point-wise full transformation, which was also applied here, calculate nicely the quite deformed shadow of the of the of the aperture. Okay, as I said, I, just, I, just, I, like, I just like to mention something here. Um, everybody who's interested in free-form light shaping, 
that's exactly what's going on. That's light shaping, obviously, right? So we, we introduce a, a aberration and we do a light shaping. If you like to have a targeted light shaping, you need to introduce specific aberrations. And that is about light shaping. So that means this is a quite good uh, demonstration of how light shaping works. Uh, you introduce aberrations and you need to realize them by preform surfaces or by um, any kind of um, other thing, um, meta surface, whatever, right? So, but I just like to mention it. It's very nice. Aberrations shape the light in propagation. Um, and this shaping of light is obviously based on uh, the situation that diffraction is not important. Otherwise, it would not work like that, right? Okay, sorry for interrupting you. No problem. You're always welcome to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Um, as I said, this example is uh, quite easy. So uh, to end up my presentation, I decided uh, to show you another very nice example, which is the Michelson interferometer. Uh, the Michelson interferometer, let's have a quick view. We have a spherical wave which is illuminating some, some lens system, which is doing some collimation. Then uh, we have uh, two uh, paths in the interferometer. Uh, we have uh, two mirrors. One mirror is slightly tilted, and we get uh, some interference pattern, or we like to get some interference pattern uh, in the detector plane. And we can do this very nicely in, in Rich Lab. So uh, this is now the real color view, but we can also check the false color view if you are interested in. Um, and what I like to do now, I like to change the second mirror to have a small microstructure on it. So, and the microstructure is also not com uh, complicated. It's a simple, a small podium. And I repeat the same simulation once more, then uh, you will also see what effect the podium has. So in this area, now there is a, the podium is high and on the other it's low. So you see there is uh, quite some effect on the interference pattern. And of course, it's also possible to include now uh, diffraction here. But here, of course, it's much more complicated to say where it is important or where it's not important. And therefore, of course, Virtual Lab provides also the way that we can set all at once to automatic. And this is done by the pointwise versus integral tool. This you simply open, select here whatever you like to set, so you can configure it individually. We say now we like to have everything to be automatic, and we apply the tool. You see the settings in the system are changing. It will perform now the simulation again, which lab will do all the stuff automatically. The simulation here is non-sequentially, with quite some paths also through the lens system. And as you can see, let's compare the both results. Uh, as you can see here, you see only the shadow. And here you see also the diffraction effects which are developing nicely through the system and which can be automatically, automatically in, uh, included in the simulation depending on uh, what the focus of your optic analysis is. So for example, here I focus now on uh, the interference pattern itself and on the, on the interference effects. And here I like to include also diffraction. So this is completely possible and it was also quite fast, I would say, for such a complicated system. So finally, I give back the word to Frank and I think then we are nearly at the end of our webinar. Absolutely, absolutely. So yes, uh, thank you again. And um, that means uh, here we saw how diffraction plays in this and that by the Fourier transforms, we control the point by sequences and how the point by sequences in free space at least uh, are related to diffraction. Good, that means uh, I hope that uh, this gave you some uh, insight about the principles we are using in virtual fusion uh, to do fast physical optics. Um, the keywords are connecting solvers. The control of seamless transition between physical and geometrical optics by this point by sequences here, and to concentrate on skipping the arithmetic fields. And at the end, I also showed that this is also related for the free space propagation, at least, for the seamless inclusion of diffraction effects dependent of its magnitude. And all the concepts together follow. Of course, these are more interpretations, but all of this follows from the guiding principle to obtain a fast physical optics, which means a technique which is mainly working linear in N wherever possible. Okay, that's enough for today. 
uh, from my side and uh, I give back to Olga. Uh, 